Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Truth About Real Estate Investing show for Canadians. Uh, who knew Canada was so awesome? I heard it many times over this past weekend. Uh, I actually saw a publication in The Economist. Uh, Toronto was ranked the number two safest city in the world. I'll hopefully find a link for that and post that somewhere else. I'll try, maybe talk about it more next, next episode. But anyways, uh, when people are shopping for a new home, you know, like the immigrants, you know, they're going to consider personal safety. And again, Toronto was ranked recently number two. All good news. Uh, but no, we're not perfect. Toronto, Canada, anywhere in Canada, no, hardly perfect. Uh, you know, there were many issues brought up in during the election. Much of it was, was valid. Uh, but yeah, no, no one's perfect. Nowhere is perfect. No investment is even perfect. Even my daughter's property that I bought her instead of an RESP, it's not perfect either. I bought it back in 2014 for 245000 Yes, that sounds great. Uh, the renovations cost about 150000 And today it's worth around 875,000. So yes, it's very, it's been excellent. It's improved my daughter's wealth considerably <laughs> for a seven year old, <laughs> but it's not perfect. My upstairs tenant uh, is inconsistent on paying us rent on time, uh, but it's not the end of the world. We will move on. And I do have bigger problems in my portfolio than that. But again, nothing's perfect. Uh, it is those who are resilient that will rise above. Uh, this past weekend, Cherry and I were at a uh, we're up north um, in the cottage area of Ontario, Muskoka specifically, for a getaway uh, with uh, a bunch of entrepreneurs. About over a hundred of them, with their um, many of them with their spouses. Uh, I belong to an entrepreneurs networking group, and uh, there were, again, there was over a hundred of us. Uh, we were all uh, this is pre-vaccine passports, so we were all swabbed. Did, we did the rapid test right after checking in. So it was actually kind of, I thought it was annoying going in, uh, but actually after it was done, it, it was actually nice to be able to feel comfortable that we were among um, folks that were COVID free. Anyways, we stayed at a Marriott in Muskoka and the views were spectacular. Uh, JW Marriott um, on Russo Lake specifically. If you haven't been, uh, I'd recommend it. It, it was, uh, it's, the views in the lake are gorgeous. And while networking with uh, fellow entrepreneurs uh, and enjoying the views with uh, lovely food and drink, uh, maybe a bit too much drink, uh, and speaking to folks uh, who travel regularly, much more than I do, and uh, many of them were first-generation immigrants, uh, they shared how much they love Canada and, and Muskoka. Uh, again, these folks have traveled extensively for business, they've seen the world. Some have even come from poverty, including second and third world countries. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance to a chance to network with successful people and have more in-depth conversations, uh, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, I, I find it a wonderful practice in developing gratitude. Uh, I'm very grateful to be a Canadian. I know, again, we have our problems. We're, we're divided on some, on some issues, a lot of issues. Uh, but otherwise, it's, this is... I don't really know where else I'd rather be. So the conversations we had were varied from travel to where folks are hiding out for winter months to raising uh, humble and successful kids. I even talked myself in, yeah, one of my biggest takeaways is I talked myself into a tea time at the prestigious Hamilton Golf and Country Club next month. Uh, I've offered to pay for myself, of course. It's, it's, it's ridiculous how expensive golf is. <laughs> real estate came up in many conversations. So folks, if you're not talking about real estate whenever you're out networking, like I'm not pushy about it, just people ask what I do. And I mentioned I invest in real estate and uh, many, uh, many asked about my experience and many were openly sharing their experience. Uh, and, uh, and also that for many, many people love to talk, like to talk about real estate. Uh, I, we, I met some uh, small landlords who have a, you know, one, two, three properties. Fantastic. Um, most, uh, that's actually a good number of folks I found did not invest in real estate. They're just so focused between uh, family and their, and their businesses that they're running. Uh, some of them own their own home. Some don't. Some are renters. Uh, some, are, some are hardcore right? They're builders or developers, you know, you know, tens of millions of dollars invested. Uh, one gentleman even <laughs> mentioned he has a metals recycling business. It's a real estate business, cause, well, it's sort of a real estate investment because he owns the property that the, the metal recycling business operates on. 
Anyways, what stuck out to me was uh, some of the entrepreneurs I spoke to, uh, ones in their 30s and 40s uh, who do not own their own home and are they're sharing with me their struggles in buying a property uh, within their budget while facing significant competition from other buyers who bid up prices uh, and well above asking and sometimes um, whatever they thought was market value. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a seller's market in case anyone didn't know. Uh, compare that to you, the listener, who has taken action. Uh, for those who've been following my blog since 20, oh wow, 2008, I forget when the blog, my blog started. Uh, and then those who have been following the podcast since uh, 2016. If you've been investing over the last five, 10, even two years ago, if you invested pre- pre-pandemic, uh, you did right. Uh, buying a house is likely isn't a problem for you. And when you get a chance, Remind your spouse and kids how lucky they are to have you, right? Because seriously, uh, if you're on the sidelines, I hope you don't plan on staying on the sidelines for very long. Uh, sophisticated investors I know, including our clients, are still acquiring investment uh, investment real estate. Uh, Cherry and I are still uh, looking for another property as well. If you have a better answer for all the inflation uh, and money printing going on by the governments all over the world, and how to deal with the lack of housing supply and the 40,000 immigrants who are coming to this country every month. If you have a better alternative for investment, please, I am all ears. I am incredibly open-minded and I, and I am actually open to contrarian opinions. You know, if I wasn't open to contrarian opinions, I would never would have, you know, gotten into real estate, uh, bought some gold, uh, invested in Bitcoin. Again, folks, none of this is advice. These are just what I'm doing myself. Uh, I have many clients who are worth uh, who are worth seven figures, who are worth more more than a lot of these small business owners with seven figure businesses. Uh, except my clients did this as a side hustle, right? Let me just repeat that. So let me just take a second to repeat that. I know invest entrepreneurs who have who whose businesses generate a million dollars in revenue. Now think about it. How easy is it to build a business that generates a million dollars revenue, or any business where you make a million dollars? either through uh, the income that you generate every year or if you build a big en- business big enough that you can sell it for a million dollars, right? Compare how easy that is. So first off, remember, everyone knows the statistic, you know, one in 10 businesses last beyond five years, I think it is. Now, how many real estate investors do you know that have made a million dollars in real estate, right? Uh, and for those of you who are still on the fence, and wanting to you know take that first step, I encourage you to go to www.investortraining.ca and register for one of our events. Uh, our I Win Real Estate free uh, event, our free training events, our Street Smart tours, and of course our networking events. So, uh, so some of our investments have a nominal charge, and 100% of the proceeds go to charity, anyways. So, if you have nothing to lose. And, and you know, even if you don't think it's worth your time, you give to charity, worst case. Uh, but if anyone's been around, I think you know the success of our clientele. So hopefully it's worth your time. On to this week's show. Today we have my old friend, uh, Rachel Oliver. Uh, we've known each other for quite a while. We first met back in Rain, I think it was. So it's been, I've known her for over five years. Uh, we mastermind together as well. She has ch- achieved massive success via an investment strategy called Rent to Own having executed 500 plus deals on said strategy. Uh, as always with the show, we look to bring you, from time to time, we look to bring you the leading subject matter expert. Sometimes we like to bring you folks who are starting out in their journey, uh, and, but here we have someone who is at the other end uh, with massive amounts of experience and uh, success in this in this one strategy. So without a doubt, we have uh, we have a, a master expert in Rachel Oliver of Clover Properties. On the show, Rachel pulls back the curtain on how she runs a successful business in real estate, uh, from how she generates leads for tenant buyers for rent owns, including uh, she shared how she will achieve uh, 800 applicants in a month on her website, uh, how she chooses markets for properties to invest in, how she's able to help 90% of her tenants buy. Uh, the house at the end of the term. Uh, I, th- I think Rachel and husband Neil are great in how they run a win-win-win business. A win for themselves, their investor, and most importantly, the, the most vulnerable in the relationship, the tenant. Uh, tenant uh, sorry, Rachel also shares how she became a, an author, a co-host of a television show, and about her extended vacation in Costa Rica. 
Uh, now I've actually forgotten to <laughs> to preface the, we're going to preface the, uh, the the interview for folks who don't know what a rent to own is. So a rent to own is uh, it's uh, a rental pro- it's a rental strategy where the tenant also signs an agreement to purchase the house at a future date. Usually it's two three years. It's just off the term is often whatever however long it takes for the tenant to qual- be able to qualify for their own mortgage between down payment and building up enough credit or repairing credit, right? So uh, the beauty of the strategy is the tenant has plans to purchase the home. So generally, therefore, they take better care of the property. And for the investor, that means uh, your tenants, again, taking better care of the property, you have to spend less on maintenance uh, and property management. So that's one of the beauties of the strategy. And uh, yeah, I uh, hope you enjoy the show. Uh, take it away, Rachel Oliver. <laughs> Hey, Rachel. Hey, Erwin. What's keeping you busy these days? The usual, my rent to own stuff and trying to find new ways of challenging myself. Uh huh. Is that challenging enough that being no. a wife and mother of two and in a pandemic with a fast growing business? <laughs> Well, to add to add to our kid and caboodle, we got a new dog who has behavior <laughs> issues. <laughs> oh no! Like like diagnosed behavior issues or uh, just standard puppy issues? <laughs> no, I think it's beyond standard. Oh no! I, I, I think we're yeah we're we're not dealing with the standard stuff, puppy issue, behavioral stuff. It, it's pushing me out of my comfort zone. Maybe a puppy will grow out of it. Mm. Okay, what's the name of the puppy? It's Quinn. And what kind of dog is it? She's an Australian Shepherd. Oh, those are cute. Those are those are like working dogs. They are. They're super smart, and they super they need a lot of activity and stimulation, and generally they're very obedient. And uh-huh. you teach them a command, and they just like I I captain. But this dog is like, you give her a command, and she like, are you talking to me? I, I'm sorry. Is it is it me that you want something from? I don't think so. Oh, yeah, so we have <laughs> so we have these issues. And then in other cases, she's like, I don't like you. I'm going to bark at you, and I might even take a nibble out of you. People in the household. Mm-hmm. Not, not the immediate family, yeah. but if someone walks in the house and she doesn't get a good vibe from them, uh-huh. she'll actually lunge and try to take a nibble. Okay. That's what I would consider a behavior problem. How, how are Quinn's instincts? Are they on point? It's, it's interesting. Um, I forecasted mm-hmm. that uh, we had a friend coming over mm-hmm. and he was installing some uh, security cameras. And mm-hmm. I said to Neil, um, just be careful. I don't think Quinn is going to get along with this guy because I know this guy's personality and he's a little bit of a tough nut, but a good guy deep down. And sure enough, when he came over, Quinn did not like him. Mm-hmm. So she... You know, I, I don't know if she's responding to something that's off about him as a person, or maybe she's just responding to something that's off uh, as far as he would be towards her. I don't know. I haven't figured that out. I'm trying to get it out of her, but she's not talking. Hmm. Can I ask how much Quinn was? <laughs> yeah, we paid about $3,500 for her in the heat of the pandemic. That's not too bad. Yeah. It's pretty good. I've heard prices going up to like eight thousand dollars for dogs. <laughs> no, I would have exonated that investment. <laughs> that the ROI on that type of an investment would have been very skeptical. No, that that's a lot. I think that's a rip. It is off. a lot. That's a rip off for a, a yeah. dog. Yeah. I wonder if prices are coming back down. I heard lumber prices are coming back more in line closer to pre-pandemic. I wonder if dog prices are coming back more in line. <laughs> I don't know, but I'd be curious to know where the labor prices are for the people that are going to be handling that lumber. Oh, it's through the roof because I keep hearing from people you can't find anybody. Exactly. I was just, I was just having lunch with an electrician, and, and he's a he's he's an electrician, but he actually has crews of electricians working for him, and he's and his business is booming, but again has trouble recruiting. Like where where did all these graduates go? Like there's always graduates from these trade schools. Where do they go? I I actually like can you recall the last time you met a trade school graduate? Like on one of your sites, I don't, I don't even if you know. I don't know if you renovate anything, but <laughs> yeah, we well we're renovating our fourplex in Hamilton. Right, right, right. But no, the trades are much more mature people. They're not. They're not your recent um, kind of grads or apprentice type of age group. Yeah. Like I've been this other, I've been at this for a while, and I have all the properties need renovations. I can't recall the last time I saw a young person on my job site. 
So where are all the young people? I what are know. they doing? Maybe they're investing in real estate. Maybe they realize that, you know, um, the easier path to mm-hmm. riches is mm-hmm. not to sit there rewiring right. or, you know, pouring concrete. Right, right. Maybe, maybe they're just going straight for the the real estate world or stock oh. hacking. Oh. <laughs> Usually need a little capital for either or to, to, to get started. But if you're listening to this show and you're, and you're uh, looking for work and you're a tradesperson, like we know lots of people that are hiring. <laughs> we can hook you up. We can hook you up. <laughs> so we have lots to talk about. Mm-hmm. It's been a while since you've been on the show by yourself. That's right. I think it's been years. The last time we did this, we were on a Zoom call. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if that's pre-pandemic. I think it was pre-pandemic. It was. It was pre-pandemic. So it was. It was it's, so it's been a while. Um, and I think at that time, I think at that time you were uh, closing in, closing in, or at around three hundred rent-to-own deals. Mm-hmm. Can you share what you are today? We're over five hundred. Over five hundred, and that people do that all the time, right? There's lots of rent-to-own companies that do five hundred deals. <laughs> I I don't know exactly, but from what I know, <laughs> um, we're probably in a league of our own. Yeah, and for the listeners' benefit, like I've been around for a bit, and I, I can, you know, there's lots of them that did not make it past two years, right? There's all these people that say, I'm going to get into rent to own, and they get going. I don't even know the reason why a lot of them don't last. Can you explain what you do different? (laughs) Well, I think we approach it from a a why it's important point of view for us, first and foremost. Um, And I think there's a lot of longevity in understanding why you're committed to a strategy. Um, For us, the purposefulness is really meaningful. It was never about the profits. It was always about the purpose. And the profits were just a big you know, icing on the cake. And that continues to be how we we operate. We lead from a place of making sure we're doing it with integrity and Mm -hmm. we're helping every um, player that's Mm -hmm. in the mix. And there's a few players. It's not just the home buyers that need the rent to own process. It's of course the investor family that's helping them. But then there's other, you know, peripheral people. There's real estate agents in the mix. There's um, mortgage agents, mortgage agents, accountants, lawyers. There's a whole, you know, a whole ecosystem of, of people. And we operate from a place of integrity and we always lead with education. Um, And we came into this place actually to educate people on what Rent-to-Own is Mm -hmm. and what it can do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm I'm just impressed in how organically it grew into something much more meaningful and something more impactful Mm -hmm. where over 500 families have used this process to get into home ownership. I'm really, I'm honored to have been part of that Mm -hmm. journey for them. And it feels good. So you want to keep doing it over and over again. So I'm going to ask you if it was the chicken or the egg. So... Did you have, were you already a real estate investor and something went sideways that you felt you had to pivot? Mm. Or did you start with an education program that taught you a bit bit about rent to own and that's how you started? So we started, I think like many investors, completely in the dark about what uh, real estate investing is really about. As far as I knew, you buy a rental property and you collect rent and you do your best not to have tenant and toilet issues. (laughs) And that's the extent of real estate investing. But then we went to um, a rich dad, poor dad Mm. seminar and we learned that real estate is much more widespread than that and rent to own is just one of the strategies within the umbrella of real estate so we started learning a little bit more about what it is and truthfully I was originally turned off that's the kind of the big secret I was turned off by the rent to own idea because everything I read indicated that it was such um, it was a good strategy but only 50% of the people that went into the rent to own process right. successfully exited right and that bummed oh, me that, that was the statistic they shared? Interesting. That was uh, most investors that were dabbling with rent owns. That was the statistic that right, they had right. given us. And I, um, I decided, okay, well, I'll learn a little bit more about the ins and outs of it before we really decide whether it's going to be something that makes sense for us. So we started by trying to find reasons not to do it (laughs) and of course learning from other people so i met a guy that actually had done over 20 rent to own deals and i wanted to learn the ins and outs from him and he also was consistent with some of the other people that only 50 percent of the deals materialize and have a successful outcome but it's really lucrative when they fail and that seemed to be kind of the the recurring sentiment from everyone that was 
involved in rent owns and that really didn't sit well with me. Right. So I think Because if you told the ten up front, there's only fifty fifty chance you're actually gonna own the own the house after all this. After you give me the option deposit and you pay the the above market rent. I don't think many of them would go for that deal. Exactly. And me as an investor, I didn't see what was the point of going through this entire charade only to have a 50-50 chance at helping somebody actually leverage the strategy. Right. And achieve home ownership. Yeah. And because and when they don't leverage the strategy properly, that's also, I, I could smell hassles and headaches on the other side, right? It can be sued. <laughs> exactly. And I just thought that's not what we want. Uh, Neil, as, as you know, my husband is super risk averse. He's like, I can't sleep at night knowing we're putting people into an arrangement where they can be out of house and home and we're on the receiving end of profits relating to yeah. that. So, because they'd probably be pretty upset. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I mean, I mean the tenants too, other than yourselves, the investors. And one of the most established investors in this space back then, like we're talking, you know, around two thousand and nine, um, he, I call him the grandfather of rent to owns. He um, stood up in a in a room where he and I were presenting on stage together, and he said, "Listen, after you've done about fifty rent to owns, expect to get sued." And I'm like, huh, we've done 80 rent-to-owns and there hasn't even been a hint of being sued. Mm -hmm. So our model was very different from the get-go. And that's actually what was like the deciding factor for us. If we could close the gaps and reduce that 50-50 variance mm -hmm. and increase the success rate, mm -hmm. then we're going to give this a shot. Right. And that was really our entire motivation right. is just to fix what wasn't working with rent to own, mm -hmm. approach it a little bit differently. You know what they say that, you know, you don't have to reinvent anything, just modify it by 5%. That's all it took? And you can get a, a, a big shift in the results. And yeah, I wouldn't say, you know, it's hard to quantify that it was 5%. I don't maybe, think it's 5%. Maybe <laughs> it was 15%. Because um, I know you guys put a lot more effort into this. We, we did put in a lot of effort. And I, I owe a lot to Neil. Uh, my husband is is an amazing numbers person and he really drilled into the numbers and mm -hmm. he identified where the gaps were. Mm -hmm. And you want to know what the biggest gap, why rent owns weren't working in the past why and that? maybe why so many people abort rent to own after they've only tried it a few times is because understanding what it's going to take for that home buyer to qualify for a mortgage at the end of the rent to own process takes a certain element of of curiosity of course, dedication and an expertise. And most people focus on how do I get people into the rent to own process? Whereas we were focused on, well, how the heck are we going to get them out? And getting them out takes into account what can they truly afford? What will it take for them to qualify for a mortgage? And just that simple perspective shift mm -hmm. changed the dynamics of how the rent to own deal was put together mm -hmm. and ultimately translated into a 90% success rate. Right, right. So 90% so success rate meaning the tenant buys out at the end of the, at the contract. 90% of the time. So nine out of 10 mm -hmm. home buyers that go through the process, complete the process and get their own mortgage. What, what was the, what was the, you say 5%, I think it's more than 5%, but what was the 5% that you, you tweaked of the process to get them from 50, from, from 50% to 90%? So the big thing was we started with their affordability. And when I talk about affordability, I'm not just talking about, well, what do they make and how much home can they afford to buy in today's real estate market? We started stress testing home buyers back in 2009 when the word stress test wasn't even a thing. <laughs> the banks hadn't even introduced that. And we were thinking, okay, well, we need to make sure that these home buyers can afford the rent to own property, even if interest rates go up. Because when they exit the rent to own process, we don't know exactly where the interest rates are going to be, but we know that they're going to be higher. So we started processing their affordability using a higher as assumption of interest rates mm -hmm. and interest payments. And if they can handle that, well, then they can handle what we're throwing at them mm -hmm. today. And that was a big shift. And then the other uh, big tweak that we made was the support that they get while they're in the rent to own process. So most investors jump into rent to own because of the allure or the assumption that it's a set it and forget it approach, right? People love the fact that you have home buyers that are renting, mm -hmm. they're going to handle all maintenance yeah, and look after the their repairs. Yeah. They have some down payment money locked in there. This is great. Well, the misnomer is that you don't need to worry about managing the property, but you do need to manage the people. And that's what we did differently. We managed the people. 
And by giving the people the guidance and giving them the support and teaching them what they needed to do to overcome some of their barriers that caused them to have to go the rent-to-own route, paid off in dividends for them and for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So can you describe some of the process, like how you, the support that you give these tenants? Like I already know because I've talked to you <laughs> and Neil when we're not recording, but for the listener, like how do you how do you help them along the way? Well, there's uh, definitely um, the the goal. The end goal is established at the beginning, so we understand what it's going to take for them to be successful. Um, in the rent-to-own process and what it'll take for them to qualify for a mortgage. And that's established at the beginning. And once we know what the roadmap is, we know when to bring in the mortgage agent. And you know, the rule of thumb is the sooner the better. And do regular check-ins with the mortgage agent. And the and basically every check-in, they're building on a different aspect of the credit repair process. Um, or they're um, you know, paying down debt or settling collections items, and somebody has to check in on their progress. That just, you know, consistent checking in mm -hmm. over the course of a two or a three or a four year rent to own mm -hmm. makes all the difference because right. the home buyers are motivated. They're willing to do it right, as right. long as they're guided on what to do. Right. And that's really what we're doing behind the scenes. And it's probably missing in most processes. I would think so. Right. Because these tenants often got themselves into trouble. They probably need some help getting out of it, right? You know, definition of an insanity, you know, keep doing what you're doing and keep getting what you get. So mm -hmm. they got they have to do something different. Exactly. And, 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 and people are they're, they're, they're receptive to this? Well, they're uncomfortable with it. I think anytime you're trying to change habits, yeah, especially yeah. bad habits. Pay my bills on time? Yeah, <laughs> come on. What is this nonsense? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then you remind them, what are the stakes? Right, you know, if you don't pay your bills on time, that thirty thousand dollars that you put into this rent to own, it's not refundable. Mm -hmm. Do you want that? We have to put things into perspective for them throughout, you know, various challenges, and mm -hmm. they hit potholes all the time. You know, a lot of these tenant buyers have uh, family members who might fall sick, and they need to send money overseas, and mm -hmm. they forget about their own bills. And then, you know, when we're noticing these types of things percolating, mm -hmm. because we're doing regular check-ins, we mm -hmm. can jump in and say, hey. What are you doing? You can't be doing that because you're doing that at the expense of your ability to get into home ownership. Mm -hmm. Find another way to solve, you know, some of the other challenges. Tap your, you know, relatives that might be able to step in to send money overseas while you're focused on your home ownership goals. You know, just being that voice of reason yeah. makes all the difference and they listen. Yeah. Take care of yourself before you try to take care of others. Yeah, put put on your own <laughs> oxygen mask before you start, you know, giving somebody else one. Yeah, don't give someone else money when it means you might lose your home. <laughs> exactly, and it's hard because they, you know they're choosing between paying their own bills and sending money home to support, you know, a relative in need. I understand the emotional conundrum with that. I completely get it. But at the end of the day, if their goal was to get into home ownership and we committed to helping them get there, we will continue to put that into perspective for mm -hmm. them. And they really do value that. And, you know, the gratitude and the the tears and the emotions um, and the joy that it brings to people is just, th there's nothing like it. It's very addictive. And that's why we keep coming back for more. Mm -hmm. 12 years of it. Right. <laughs> and we can't get enough. <laughs> Just to give the listener an idea, how many how many rent to owns are you entering in a month, and then how many are you, are you closing in a month? As in closing, as in like handing the keys over to the tenant, like for the last time. <laughs> well, in a month, there's a lot of things happening. It's not just people entering the rent to own process. We yeah. also have people exiting the yeah. rent to own process. So there's a constant kind of ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. um, there, it's not really a hard fast number mm -hmm. because we're at the mercy of what's happening with the inventory on the market. How yeah. often can home buyers actually go out to look at properties in their price point, and it's seasonal, you know, during the summer months, they're preoccupied with, you know, being at the cottage, vacationing with their relatives, so they're not getting out as often, so that affects the deal flow. And then when they're back to work in the September, October, you know, fall season, then it, it comes in like gangbusters, and then it peters out around the holiday season, and then of course reactivates around the spring season. So it's constantly ebbing and flowing, and uh, a lot of, and the intensity of the ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be anywhere from three deals in one week mm -hmm. to five deals in one week, depending on what's happening with the real right. estate market in the season. So it's busy, busy. It can be. And you're like, how many, who manages the client? How many people manage this business? 
So the 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 back end, the front end, or everything? Uh, let's start with the tenant. Who who actually talk, talks to the tenant? So we have a four step qualification process. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it is handled by technology, mm -hmm. and part of it is ha handled by uh, three human beings. <laughs> um, wow, it's complicated. Okay, so sorry, my, my, my question was more around prop quote unquote property management, because property management for your business is different than pretty much everybody else's yeah. buy and hold property management portfolio. So how many people talk to the tenant? Who talks to the tenant? So the tenants are matched with a mortgage team okay. at the beginning. Oh, no, no, sorry, sorry. I mean tenants that are already in your properties. Yeah. A mortgage team works with them. And the mortgage oh. team is an extension of our team. Right. So essentially they step in when the tenant buyer closes or moves in, when the rent owner kicks in and the, rent, and the tenant buyer moves in, um, there is a process to get them onboarded with the mortgage team. Wow. And the mortgage team, of course, is in direct communication with Neil. Neil is kind of the overseer uh -huh. of uh, the kind of pre-screening process. Right. And ultimately, he's making sure that the tenant buyers are achieving their goal throughout the rent-to-own process. So he's getting constant input from the mortgage team. That's awesome. So he's overseeing the process, and the mortgage team is really keeping the, right. uh, the tenant buyer going forward. So... Sorry, my, my question was around like how much effort is involved in managing uh, your, your tenant relationships while they're in the property. And it sounds like it's not much. <laughs> I wouldn't say, um, I wouldn't say there's as much effort now as there was when we were first starting out in the space. Over time, as any business, you, you, it, you have to have systems, you have to have processes. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of systems and processes that we have put, put in place. So the effort has become a lot more systemic. Mm -hmm. And if it's systemic, it's, mm -hmm. I think, less, or it seems less of a burden, or maybe we're just you know desensitized and it's just commonplace. But at the beginning, making phone calls, checking in, getting them to respond, getting them to fill in a form, giving us an update, pulling their credit. That was extremely taxing, extremely time consuming. And as we were doing more and more deals and we had more and more rent own mm -hmm. people in the rent own process, it became overwhelming. And that's when we realized, okay, either we sacrifice this back end support to help them get to the finish line, or we systemize it to make it easier on them and to make it easier on us. So now that it's systemized, it's it's definitely a lot more manageable. Right, but but also the like the the effort you've seen to have delegated to the mortgage professional, and but they're incentivized to get them to get to a mortgage because that's how they get paid, honestly. And also, it's a it's a win win that way. That's pretty awesome. Exactly. It it builds it builds an opportunity for the mortgage team to have a funnel of business opportunities. And there, our mortgage team, everyone who works with us is very committed to the cause. Everyone loves knowing that we're making a positive impact. Mm -hmm. Everyone that's part of our team, whether internal or peripheral, everyone recognizes that we're doing something super special to help a bunch yeah. of really amazing people right. overcome their barriers. And every it's all hands on deck and it feels effortless. Right. Well, it's such a win for the mortgage person too, because. The expected outcome is ninety percent chance they're going to get a mortgage out of this client. Exactly. Like try to like, try to get that off the street. <laughs> try, try, try to like put up a sign. I'm a mortgage person. Let's <laughs> so run a hundred people through as leads. Let's see how many deals you get. It exactly. won't be ninety percent. <laughs> exactly. And then the lifetime value of that relationship, right? That's just the entry point. And then there's renewals. There's upsizing, downsizing. You know, uh, some of our tenant refis buyers and, refis. Yeah, yeah, and some of our tenant buyers have gone on to become real estate investors, who are now helping other tenant buyers rent to own. So it, it is, you know, a cycle and mortgage agents are on the receiving end mm -hmm. of something that has more value than just that initial mortgage mm -hmm. that they take after the rent to own. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's why we get along so well. Because that's because I'm, uh, as I'm getting older, like I don't need more money, really. So I'm like much more picky about what I do. And like I, I, whatever I invest in, whatever I invest in personally has to be a win, win, win. Right. I, I, uh, you know, I had I was having dinner with uh, with these other real estate investors, and then they were saying how they're buying a building in a place in Nova Scotia, and where they have no rent control. So their their plan is just to buy the building, and raise rents, right? And I always think like I always say, I say this to my kids. I say this to my kids, especially when they do something bad. And I was like, okay, who? Especially when like my my youngest hits hits his sister. And I'm like, okay, are you helping or are you hurting, right? So if you just buy an apartment building and you do nothing to it, all you do is raise rents. Who did you help? 
and who did you hurt, mm-hmm. right? And so, yes, it's a great model to make money. It doesn't fit my value system, right? So versus you, like you're truly trying to you built everything to get that out, that positive outcome for the tenant, right? And because they're the most at risk in this in this relationship, right? The mortgage person, the investor, like you, a deal goes sideways, you'll survive, right? Deal goes sideways for the for the tenant, it's not gonna be pretty, right? Like that's probably yeah. like the last. 30 grand you, or whatever. You got it. Absolutely. That's their they, home. They've scraped together their, you know, blood, sweat, and tears to to come into this rent-to-own yeah. arrangement. And this is their last shot at getting into home ownership and yeah. overcoming certain barriers. And breaking the cycle of being a tenant. And they're putting a lot of trust into the process and mm-hmm. into us. And we take that very seriously. We did from the get-go. And that's actually, I think, one of the things that was very discouraging about the reputation that rent to own had when mm-hmm. we entered it because we were scrutinized with the same lens of you know wanting to screw people because you know the standard model is that when somebody uh, doesn't succeed with their rent to own commitment the investor profits and makes out with probably a bigger win and that was the reputation we were entering mm-hmm. Mm-hmm in this rent to own space. And that was the reputation we had to go up against and prove ourselves. And it's taken a long time. It probably took a good six or seven or eight years before people recognize that we do rent to own differently. Mm-hmm. We're not in this to do it the same way that rent to owns have been done. And we had to earn that respect through seeing deals turn over complete. Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know, referrals start to kick in. It took a while, uh, it took a while. it's quite a cycle, mm-hmm. but I'm glad we stayed the course. And maybe that's why, one of the reasons why there's not a lot of people in this business that stick around for a decade or more, because it, you know, to earn the reputation takes time. And most people want a quick buck in right. and out. And we never did it for the quick buck. We actually did it to replace our corporate incomes. The cash flow was so juicy that I wanted that predictable, consistent flow of cash that would replace the stability of having a job. Mm -hmm. So we had to get this right. Okay, so there's lots of other other brilliant parts of your business. So like the back end is, is, you know, in my opinion, quite solid. Now, how do you find so many tenants? Because I remember when Rent-to-Own became like a big thing, like someone came came with a book and then everyone started Rent-to-Own. It was like the flavor of the, you know, couple years. And so everyone went to gangbusters, people were posting ads on Kijiji and whatnot. Uh, and then it was what people always consistently say, like the tenant you're looking for is like needle in a haystack. But again, like your deal flow is greater than almost anyone I know personally. Like what, what is it about your, your, um, your business that attracts tenants on a regular basis? And again, like you're offering them something that people haven't even heard of before, right? I'm sure some of these listeners haven't heard of rental to rent home before. So how, how did you, educate, convince people to do this, even just start talking to you or to even land on your website, whatever it is. That's a really great point. I mean, at the beginning, we did what everybody else did. We advertised on Kijiji, Craigslist, mm-hmm. and um, and we were getting a lot of uh, skeptics. And, you know, it was a needle in a haystack mm-hmm. experience. And then at some point after kind of spinning our wheels and, you know, driving all over Ontario to meet people and have face-to-face conversations to let them know that we're sincere about helping them and we we have the means and the intentions to do so, there was a lot of face-to-face contact. We, you know, we would meet at Tim Hortons in, you know, all parts of Ontario. We would go to our corporate jobs, come home, and I remember Neil getting off the GO train and literally jumping in the car to drive for an hour and a half to meet somebody, you know, at a Tim Hortons and talk about whether or not they're a good fit for rent own. And at right. that point, they were just... So you just, guys hustled. Let's just say that you guys hustled. Yeah, they, <laughs> yeah. It, it was a lot of work to establish that trust and reputation. And when we started having children, um, or actually our second child, I said to Neil, that's not sustainable. We need to find a, a, a better way of doing it. So I came up with the idea of writing a book. And I think that was probably the single most important thing we ever did. I know some people call it marketing. Um, you can call it marketing, but for us, it was more about uh, education. One of the things that we found was that everybody was asking us the same question. How does it work? What are the pros and what are the cons? Right. 
And we thought, well, you know what? If we're already answering this question right. one-on-one, that means there's going to be thousands of other people who have exactly the same question. Why don't we just put the answers into a book? And at that point, we had done about 50 rent-to-own deals, and we had counseled you know, hundreds of, of people on the topic. So it just made sense to do a brain dump of everything we knew and make it accessible. Because at the time, there were no other resources. The, the book that you're talking about that came out back in 2009, it was for investors. And it was a great book, um, but it didn't answer the questions of what is the journey like for the home buyer. And there were no Canadian trusted resources, so we thought, well, heck, if there isn't one, why don't we be that resource? So we wrote a book, it's about 100 pages, paperback, available on Amazon.ca. And to be honest, I think that has been really the number one way a lot of people have been finding us is this resource somehow gets passed around um, between real estate agents, mortgage agents, someone somehow finds our book and hands it to somebody, and then we get a phone call saying, I got your book, I bought your book, I wanna learn more, I wanna see how this is done. No kidding, so someone has to go pay for the book? To learn how to do business with you? Not necessarily. <laughs> oh, if, unless they got lucky enough for someone to give it to them. Sometimes they buy it. Sometimes they gift it. You can. You don't even need to. Um, you can even rent it on Amazon. You can do like. Kindle, you can I do think, that. Yeah, you can Never like. Heard of that. Yeah, if you have a Kindle, apparently, yeah, there's like a. You can like borrow it under a Kindle sign out or something. Wow. So it, it's so accessible like for free. Okay. And that was our goal. Our goal was really to create a resource that was accessible to anybody mm -hmm. from all walks of life mm -hmm. to learn about the ins and outs of rent owns. So, so they come to the equation more empowered, more educated mm -hmm. versus uh, coming into it uh, with a potential of being a victim. We were tired of hearing those victim stories. We were tired of trying to rescue rent owns gone bad. And we thought, read the book, know how it works, know which questions to ask and what answers to listen for. You have no excuses. What's the book called? I probably need some copies. Rent to an Essential Guide for Home Buyers. I should probably order some copies for the office. Because um, again, you know, they're, not everyone can qualify. <laughs> I actually would like to know what from a mortgage agent, how many, how many people that call can actually qualify for a mortgage? Well, there was a statistic, I think the uh, Canadian Mortgage Association um, put out a few years ago and they said something like a hundred thousand Canadians got disqualified for a mortgage and that number seems you know at first glance it seems kind of high but think about all the people that aren't even bothering to go into the bank because they already know yeah. they are they have tarnished credit they've gone through a consumer proposal a bankruptcy mm -hmm. and what's the use why bother going to a bank I know I won't be qualified so I feel that number is much higher than a hundred thousand that the research shows and I, I believe that number is going to continue to grow there's a lot of people who um, got affected by COVID. Mm -hmm. They lost employment, uh, they had to dip into their savings and mm -hmm. they can't now, uh, you know, they don't have the closing costs mm -hmm. um, to get that home and the real estate values continue to climb mm -hmm. and they're afraid that they're going to get priced out. What do you do? Rent to own is the answer for a lot of those people. So we're here to help. So when someone has the book, is your I can I'll buy the book eventually, <laughs> like when we're done this call. <laughs> I'll give you an autographed copy. Oh, thank free you. Free of charge. I my need, pleasure. <laughs> I will need multiple. I'm not asking for multiple copies, but I I think my team needs some copies in case we need to hand these out to folks who who are in those situations. We think we can help. Rent to own would help. Um, so there's like a phone. They, there's like a phone number there and a website or. Yeah, information on how to reach us, absolutely. Okay, do you want to share it in case anyone listening needs this? Sure. Um, the website is rethinkrenting.com. And it's a, your business, your website's busy, I'm guessing? Yeah, we, yeah we've had, uh, in the last three months, nearly 800 applicants for our rent loan <laughs> program. How many qualify? <laughs> that number is a little bit lower um, and the qualification process is lengthy. Um, so it's not like, you know, from the day that you apply, we'll right. have a, a yes or no answer. Right. Like, like I said, it's a four step process. Yeah. So the qualification takes a little while and we'll only know maybe a month later whether or not they can actually go through. Right, how much is that as automated versus? I would say about 40%. Mm. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. As that's a mortgage an, person, they would love that. That's an investment in of itself, too. Do you want to share? <laughs> <laughs> we're not done with that investment. When we're done, I'll let you know. 
<laughs> yeah, because I know and you, when we, another time ago, you were, you're sharing your, the, yeah, automation's not easy, but it, it's got to happen, but it is often painful to get there. And again, like any business process, I don't think it's a set it and forget it, which I was hoping it would be, but I got the rude awakening that it's not. It's just ongoing and it just is here to stay. It's going to be a mainstay as part of our right. business practices. Right. Like those gro- like those grocery shopping robots that we were talking about, you're sharing about. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. You don't just build it and walk away from it. You're always going to have to improve, enhance, upgrade. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're Tweak. doing behind the scenes. Always tweaking done. Like if you're a mar- like marketers, you're always tweaking. You're test- yeah, you're yeah. testing, you're trying, you're experimenting. And the world around you isn't standing still either. So, you know, what was working last month isn't necessarily going to work six months from mm-hmm. now. So you mm-hmm. always have to keep adapting as well. So you're not necessarily tweaking uh, in trying something new. Sometimes you're tweaking to adapt to what's happening mm-hmm. in the market around you. So you mentioned market. How has how has the market changed since you started? Do you think mm-hmm. do you think because of affordability being so poor, there's more people applying, or is this just it's maybe because we're seeing we're seeing it in the news more often now it seems people renting people investing in rental companies in the U.S. I think it was something even mentioned in, in by our um, federal party leaders where they believe one of them s- suggested this could be the way into home ownership for some. <laughs> Well, I'm glad to hear that uh, our federal government is using the words rent to own. Um, What I do question is their definition of it and their intentions Uh for how it's truly going to solve some of the challenges homebuyers are having. Um, Because you still have challenges. We'll get to that. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, to your question, how has the market changed? It it has changed a lot. And and I I can honestly say if rent is not done right, it's not going to solve the affordability problem. And in fact, it has never, based on how other rent-to-own models have, have been working, I've never seen it to solve an affordability issue. We do things differently. And we started off that way from the beginning. That was one of the things, you know, you asked me earlier, what were some of the things you did differently to change up your model? One of the things that we did differently was to also leave money on the table, meaning that we help the home buyers in the rent to own process build up equity so that they can ultimately get into home ownership by buying a property that's a little bit below market value. And that purchase price is locked in at the beginning. So if the property goes up in value by 50, 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars over and above the price that we locked in for them at the beginning, that's their equity. And that's also their affordability. And most rent owns sadly don't operate that way. And that's why it doesn't solve the affordability challenge um, un- unless there's an equity buildup. Right. And that's what we account for. And that's what we did back you know, in, in the good old days in 2009. Because although it seems that real estate prices are going up and this affordability uh, issue is plaguing us, in 2009, 2010, 2011, homebuyers had exactly the same problem. They couldn't afford to get into home ownership. Mm-hmm. And, and salaries were not going up um, as, as high as real estate values were. So <laughs> over the last 12 years, we've been basically doing- I think doing longer. I think last probably, 30 years probably. Well, in our, yeah, but we've been doing this for 12 years. Yeah. So in our little you know 12 year history of doing this, we've always been solving the affordability issue. We've always been doing that through our rent-to-own process. So I don't think that's ever going to go away. I don't think our federal government is going to solve that problem uh, just by talking about rent to own. I like that they're thinking in those terms, but execution is really where mm-hmm. it's at. Mm-hmm. And that takes time to perfect. Did you happen to listen to my episode with Daniel Dubois, who's uh, one of the owners of Life at Key? You have to yeah. check it out. I'll have to check it out now. Because their business models is almost like the easiest way to explain it is basically fractional rent to own. So they actually take large, like uh, they'll take lar- uh, a large percentage of condo units in a building, mm-hmm. and basically kind of rent to own them, mm-hmm. essentially. In case you're looking to upscale, <laughs> upsize, upsize. Yeah, because he actually shared that they're actually looking at buying s- uh, single-family duplex as well. So if they're willing to come to that level, then you should be willing to go to their level. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Sounds good. I know who I'm calling after this Life podcast. At Life at Key. Maybe we can get together for our golf game. Um, yeah, Daniel Dubois, uh, fascinating guy. Also, someone trying to change the world. Um, win, win, win. Um, so you like you guys would get along. Um, so we talked about front end uh, because again, 
the stuff that you discussed was not shared in any educational program or book I read. Even the books that are written for investors on, on how to how to uh, how to generate leads for 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 tenants, because uh, actually, who taught you how to do that? To, to, who taught? Did anyone teach you that marketing strategy? You start with a book. No. 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 I you just, I, read, you just wrote an FAQ, a hundred page FAQ. <laughs> our goal was to really help home buyers access the information without right. needing us to call them back because. Our phone kept ringing and everybody wanted information and we didn't want to short circuit those conversations, but we had to because there's only so many hours in a day and we right. had small kids and we were, you know, in our corporate right. world, you yeah. know, taking the go train to and from downtown. Yeah. 800 applicants in a month. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mercy. Yeah, there, there was a lot to juggle. So we thought, well, what's the most efficient way for us to distill our information and make it accessible to people 24-7? Well, <laughs> thank God for Amazon. Thank God. And uh, and then we thought, well, we've got this platform, Amazon. Let's put a book on there, and mm -hmm. and hopefully it'll make a difference to a few people. Now I want to ask about the investor side because it doesn't seem like you have any issue raising capital for for, for these projects. <laughs> How about the investor side? Did you do the same thing? You wrote a book on it for investors. <laughs> <laughs> no, we actually didn't take a book approach with the investors, uh, but we did still take an educational approach. Investors are pretty savvy. Investors know how to do their own research and um, investors naturally gravitate to forums where they can learn from each other. I was invited to speak on a lot of stages, podcasts. I was very fortunate to mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. my own TV um, TV mm -hmm. show and share knowledge. And that's really what those opportunities are. And every time I would share knowledge, um, it would activate further uh, inquiries from investors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, of course, in those conversations, I share more knowledge. I never sell. I, I find selling is not the best approach in, in cultivating relationships. And I don't even call it marketing. I don't know. I don't know even what to call it. It was just really knowledge sharing. And that's kind of how, how we grew, just talking about what we do, why we do it, mm -hmm. and why are we different. And if some aspects of that resonates with someone mm -hmm. and I can help them achieve their goals mm -hmm. with cash flow or their goals with um, creating more time and f uh, time freedom in their day, then heck, let's talk. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was really more about about that. How can I help you solve one of your challenges on your journey as a real estate investor? And we we grew our list of, of followers organically and we have you know a, a, a beautiful community, of over 250 investors that uh, work with us. What are your qualification criteria for, for investors? Because that's a, that's a lot of investors. Do you have like, geez, do, do they all, does Neil manage them all? <laughs> no, that responsibility falls on me. <laughs> There's still 250 of them. <laughs> yeah, but that's okay. You know what? I find for the most part, most investors are low maintenance. Because once they've done a deal, they know how it works. Um, and, and once they've exited a deal, they get back in line to do another deal. So it's um, a lot of it is rinse and repeat. And I, I love what I do. So it doesn't even feel like work. Right. Uh, can you, for the listener's benefit, because a lot of people are looking to raise capital and have um, equity partners, credit partners, credit partner meaning like they provide the mortgage and whatnot. Uh, what are your qualifying criteria, um, both on the hard side and the soft side, like personality wise, for example? Well, there's different things. So sometimes we can do a joint venture where I am the mortgage partner and I'll need a cash partner. Mm -hmm. So someone who has access to capital, ideally, you know, their own savings versus, you know, uh, funds from a HELOC because it's cheaper to use your own money. So the profits are higher. So that's one dynamic. And another dynamic, we can be a joint venture where uh, we come in as a cash partner and somebody else takes title. And then there's other dynamics where um, investors want the deal to themselves. They don't want to joint venture. They've got the capital. They can qualify for a mortgage and uh, they want to do the deal themselves. And that's where the turnkey model comes in and we'll put the deal for them and take a fee. Uh, how, do you, how do you split that up? Because like, you know, it sounds like you have good deals, <laughs> but you actually will just sell the deal for money <laughs> and still manage the process Absolutely. till the end. Absolutely. We, yeah, we get remunerated. I mean, we have a flat fee and a portion of it is paid at the beginning. A portion of it is paid at the end and, um, and the investor owns the deal. So we don't have an equity stake, right, right. but we um, hold off getting the full payment 
till the end. So it's we're st- we're still you. in the deal. <laughs> <laughs> With all the work that you put, you guys put in. I guess you can't you can't own every deal, but <laughs> absolutely not. You know, and our goal was never to own every single deal. Our our goal was always to add value, mm-hmm. and 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 profitability will just inherently follow. Right. Yeah. You take care of the customer, and then the money will come. Absolutely. That's one of my favorite business cases from uh, from business school was uh, Southwest Airlines. So like, I think the only profitable airline in the US. <laughs> Absolutely, and they always yeah. put the people first. And that yeah. was our motto from the beginning. And as you know, some rent to owns, they don't even start with the people. They start with a property where you get a property, put some lipstick on it, and then you rent to own it as kind of an exit strategy because you want to capitalize on the longer term appreciation. That never sat right with us because in those scenarios, it was always more about the property, not the people. And we thought, you know, we're trying to help solve a problem for mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. So we should start with the people, mm-hmm. figure out what they need, mm-hmm. and then let them go shopping for a property, find one that right. makes sense, and do the deal, you know, based on a property that is suitable for whatever needs they have versus I ha- I'm an investor and I need somebody to rent to own this property. I need to hit this amount of money monthly and I'm in this to make this amount of profit. I think that was one of the differentiators in how we approached rent to own right it was not so much about the property and the profits it mm-hmm. was about the people mm-hmm. and the purpose mm-hmm. and the profits were kind of like third on the list so then what cri- what how do you define for them to go shopping then like like for example say i wanted to live in thunder bay <laughs> am i your customer <laughs> probably not uh-huh. we don't touch the northern part of ontario we have specific criteria for which markets markets we will serve service and most of you know southern ontario the golden horseshoe fits right in and, and then what else, what other criteria can they do a condo apartment can they do a fourplex <laughs> <laughs> great question so you know most uh, single family um homes will work you know some in some cases a duplex will work because if a home buyer wants to have rental income and they happen to find a property that makes sense where they can rent out um, the lower level we support that as well so you can rent to own a duplex technically but you have to be prepared to cover the monthly payments if your tenant doesn't pay mm-hmm. right that, that's the harsh reality of being an investor so mm-hmm. of course because they have to deal with the tenant and toilet exactly they have the tenant and toilet um, but they're still renting to own you know condos townhouses all of those types of properties work and a fourplex technically could work um, if the investor lives in one of the units and rents out the other three Mm -hmm. but again what happens if three of the tenants don't pay or two of the tenants don't pay you have to have the income to to Mm -hmm. back it up so as long as you have the income we can make it work credit we don't care about credit we can help establish down payment we can help build that up Um, it's the income that's really the, the deciding factor of what kind of a property mm-hmm. someone can rent to own. Mm-hmm. What kind of income ranges are, are, do folks need to qualify? Mm, I'm sure it depends on the market, right? Exactly. And that, versus... That's like a moving target. Yeah. <laughs> and it, yeah, it depends um, how much they earn. But I would say, you know, we're dealing with entry level prices for, for most markets. You know, say five. Entry level prices have doubled in like the last four years. I know. But <laughs> you it, know better than anybody. But it depends what market. <laughs> I still feel confident that you can find a decent property for about $550, 580 uh-huh. Um, in in some parts of the GTA, you know, outskirts of Durham, we're still doing deals in the five hundred eighty thousand dollar price point, and uh, the tenant buyers would need to have a household income of about a hundred and thirty, a hundred and you know, a hundred and thirty, hundred and thirty five combined. And then. And what are what are these properties? Are these houses or are these condos? So the ones that are so um, in the Durham region, uh, that 580, 585 price point, we're seeing towns. Single family detached would be a little bit more expensive, or right. you'd have to go further out to you know markets like Curtis or maybe Belleville, um, you know St. Catharines, a little bit further out than London. Windsor is a great market, mm-hmm. you know, if you have a limited budget and you're willing to be flexible as a home buyer. Windsor is an excellent market to get into. Mm-hmm. Great properties, you get a lot of bang for your buck, and you can still get something in the you know high three hundreds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we were talking before we were you were, we were recording. Your your focus is well, part of your focus is on 
for at least the market that you're looking at is there has to be jobs and there has to be appreciation, right? Is that right? Oh, well, this, well, is a, this is a podcast. You're the, you're the, you're the, you're the verbally. <laughs> Rachel's yeah. nodding her head. I'm nodding my head. Sorry. Yes. I'm taking it for granted. You're just seeing me nodding. Yes, I'm nodding my head. So we do have to see a certain amount of uh, growth in an area. So yeah. there has to be new development. There has mm-hmm. to be, you know, some sort of uh, transport. There has mm-hmm. to be road construction. Mm-hmm. Um accessibility to other roadways, all of those uh, fundamentals as real estate investors that we have always learned from the Mm get-go, they have to apply. And we do have to see a steady appreciation, which means that um, younger families are moving into the market and there's just ongoing demand from first-time home buyers. Mm -hmm. Those are super ripe for for rent-to-own deals. so you mentioned before you guys used to drive to these properties. Are you driving to Windsor? Because <laughs> I know you live in like the northeast of the GTA. Like, so do you do you go to, are you guys seeing these properties? How there, wa- you- there was a time we now have, like I was saying, we have an extended team and there are feet on the street. Mm-hmm. So we have um, a network of real estate agents mm-hmm. uh, that are experts in certain markets mm-hmm. and they are very experienced in what we do. They're knowledgeable and of course they have their real estate licenses and real estate training and mm-hmm. they are our eyes and ears on all of these markets right. that we can't get to. And so like, what do you know about the property before you make the offer? Because you guys are still signing the offers, are you not? So it depends. Um, if they inv- if there's another investor that is doing a turnkey deal, that investor is involved directly in the acquisition of the property mm-hmm. and the real estate agent is supporting um, them from all areas so right. comps right, right. um you know information on on the condition of the home uh information on the area uh videos photos most investors don't drive to the property most investors wow. defer yeah. to the professionals and remember there is always a mandatory home inspection mm-hmm. so that condition is never over overlooked mm-hmm. um, either we do a pre-inspection and do a clean offer if the home passes an inspection or um, we have you know no other clause other than conditional on an inspection um, the property has to pass inspection mm-hmm. if it's less than five years old and that's, that, doesn't, that doesn't make your job easy, easy to acquire property then, right? It makes us less competitive in, in a multi-bid situation, absolutely. And that's mm-hmm. why we have to be very strategic about the type of um, real estate agents we team up with. They need to understand what we're trying to do. They need to have some tricks up their sleeves mm-hmm. to be able to negotiate deals. And I think one of the strategies is that when you're in a smaller community, it's best to work with agents that are in that community because those relationships sometimes um, trump the just the standard bidding process. And that's where we, we have seen some um, opportunities percolate. If it's just a GTA-based uh, real estate agent that's making an offer in a smaller community um, and we have the inspection clause, we'll get blown out of the water. But when it's two agents from the same community and they know each and, other, and, they know each other yeah. and the selling agent understands what the buying agent is involved with as far as a rent tone goes. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of humility in that. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we, you know, we can still win the bid. Right, right. Also, you can be more aggressive with your inspection, like, oh, I'm inspector here tomorrow. Exactly. Right. Versus people like just blanket five days. Exactly. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> That's well, really different. That's a very different conversation. <laughs> absolutely. And and as a real estate agent, you've also seen you you've been on the receiving end of all of these offers that have all these extra conditions, and mm-hmm. you you'll just like dismiss them. In in today's market, you can you have the luxury of doing that, mm-hmm. and um, it certainly makes it diffi- more difficult for us mm-hmm. um, in in the context of what we do, um, and. Somebody, I'll, if someone says to me, okay, well, what's the most challenging part of the rent to own process? And honestly, it's actually winning the offer. If I had to say, like, what well, is. Well, the last 10 years, yeah. <laughs> it's winning the offer. <laughs> Do you, are you guys looking for more agents? Always. Oh, yeah. Uh, any particular markets? Because we have, there's some agents that listen to this show in case they want another, they'd like to work with uh, your clientele. Let's see. Um, I wouldn't discriminate against any of the top 10 towns across Ontario and the smaller communities 
around the top 10 towns. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we need more representation. We need more real estate agents, whether or not they're part of the transaction, we just need more real estate agents to be aware Mm -hmm. that there is a solution for home buyers that are getting turned down uh, by the banks. And if that real estate agent, if if every one real estate agent knew uh, what rent own is and isn't, they would be, making it that much easier for more and more home buyers to get into home ownership in today's real estate market. Yeah. So you don't need to be affiliated with our rent own company, but any advice I can share, and that's, you know, real estate agents get to know the fundamentals. And if anyone asks you about when, what rent own is, um, guide them to a resource they can trust. Like your website? <laughs> like our website or our book, or your book. you know, the rent own essential guide for home buyers. Right. So maybe, if anyone wants to reach out to you, maybe they could do us you a favor and read the book first before they <laughs> before they inquire to get, start getting leads from you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we have other resources. If you don't have time to read a book, it's hundred we'll, pages. We'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll 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 give you the Coles notes. <laughs> oh mercy! Come on, folks. It's hundred pages, and you're talking about thousands in commission. <laughs> like, at some point, they'll have to read the book. <laughs> Nothing wrong with some education, folks. So where where do we grow? Where do you grow from here? Because the the joke, for example, I make with Windsor investors is like, what's because wait, wait, a lot of people have gone to Windsor because for affordability, mm-hmm. but you've run out of road. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then my joke is, you, they go to Detroit, Detroit next. Oh <laughs> gosh. <laughs> what, how do you grow next? Because you you mentioned like you know you're always looking for learning and being uncomfortable. Where do you go next? I think that's the challenge right now is to figure out how do we modify or adapt the model to make it even more affordable and even more within reach Mm -hmm. for home buyers that are still left out in the cold. Mm -hmm. You know, nearly 800 applicants. I I wish I could even help 80% of them, Mm -hmm. but the reality is I can't because their income or or their down payment is just not enough. Mm -hmm. So right now, you know, I'm scratching my head to try to figure out what else can we do? What mm-hmm. can we do differently? What haven't we tapped into? And like what you were saying, you know, uh, look at what can you do with the condo market? You know, uh, can we can we tap into other markets mm-hmm. that trailer parks? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there there was a time when I was even thinking, what about rent to own a tiny home? That even sounds nice mm-hmm. as as a little riddle. Rent to own a tiny home. Um, I'm not even sure about that, but. You know, we're scratching our head to see what else can mm-hmm. we do mm-hmm. to make the program more accessible mm-hmm. and and more pliable to allow more home buyers right. to realize their dream of ownership. I'm sure the, some listeners are even thinking like, oh, we just go to other cities. Uh, but you know what we've already discussed about Ontario. Or name uh, outside of Ontario, I'm not saying you you name because I'm sure you, should, you can name them all pretty easily. But name other cities outside of southwestern Ontario, like Golden Horseshoe that have jobs and appreciation anywhere that's near anywhere at the same level that we see where in the markets that we invest yeah right you're right we're so lucky to be here we are blessed we are blessed but one of the things that we have going against us is the rising prices of yeah. real estate because yeah, the what's inventory, helped us has hurt us as well <laughs> that's right the inventory is is still challenging so maybe getting into construction the nice thing is that we you have need the land, land first <laughs> we yes we have land but you have to go further out to get it right, right. so either you go out of province or you just go out of the outskirts mm-hmm. which is it going to be there's some opportunities in that too mm-hmm. it's not easy is it if it was easy I'm, everyone would be doing it we're not talking about rationality of decision making. <laughs> we just we just had an election, so. <laughs> oh yeah, so let's not go there. <laughs> no, we won't go there. Six hundred million dollars later. Uh, oh, I wanted to ask you about TV. So you, you've been on TV. Um, uh, previous previous times you've been on the show, you shared how you did. Uh, you were you had a TV show, Mothers of Real Estate. Uh, and actually, um, can you share how that ended? Why it ended? Because because ah. media's media's changed so much in the last 10 years yeah it it definitely has i mean our start with with television was at a community level Mm -hmm. with rogers Mm -hmm. and uh rogers 
invited us to to speak to them about what it would look like to have a TV show that teaches mothers and you know other everyday others, mothers, mothers, mothers and others <laughs> on how to profit with real estate, how mm-hmm. to get involved. You know what? Because a lot of people have it in the back of their head, but nobody really knows where to start. So that was the premise of the show. You know, these three moms um, that pursued different real estate investing strategies. Um, they ended up replacing their full-time job incomes or their corporate jobs. And, you know, between us, we have 10 children. So we're doing this um, while taking risks, uh, you know, with, with our family funds. And who knows where this is going to go. We still have mouths to feed. So all, all of this is very relatable and, um, and, and especially at a community level. So Rogers liked our pitch and ultimately signed us up. And we did, I believe, six episodes. We recorded six episodes and uh, then they pulled the funding. So all community Rogers stations got right. shut down. The province pulled the funding? Is that how it worked? I believe okay. so, yeah, yeah. On a provincial level, the province was funding community television and Rogers now didn't have this funding. Right. So Rogers then pulled back all of these uh, right. stations. and Lots we, of stations. Yeah, yeah. All, all over, all over Ontario. Yeah. And I, you know, I, th- I think that's sad. Um, because I think they, they, it had a lot of merit. It wasn't just our, our program. There was a lot of other programming that was mm-hmm. relevant to senior citizens in the community mm-hmm. or stay-at-home parents in the community. I don't know. I just thought I, I thought it had a lot of value. Nonetheless, that's how it ended. Right. Oh, but- sorry, just before you finish that point, because I'm, I'm, I've been heavily critical of, of media. Uh, because the way it's gone these days is because there is no money in it anymore. Like, take the, take the newspaper business. Um, like... Kijiji and Craigslist took all the classified ads, mm-hmm. right? So they lost all that business. And then the internet made the newspaper a less viable source for advertising, mm-hmm. right? So now media is often related to just trying to make people angry and read stuff, read their stuff. Yeah, I think right. the way we consume um, video content also yeah. got redefined with the rise of YouTube. Mm-hmm and Netflix, you know, all everything is on demand. Everything is, you know, at the click of a button. Yep. And community programming wasn't like that. Yes. You had to wait for your, you know, your episode to air, like the good old days, you know, you check in, in the TV guide, mm-hmm. what time is that mm-hmm. show airing? Um, and it was a bit more archaic. And mm-hmm. I think just the, the way consumers want to have access to media mm-hmm. has changed. So it's natural that these types of community programs would no longer serve their needs. Right. What they could have done is maintain the community programming, but make it more accessible online. Online, yes. Right, Adam? <laughs> Ra- rather than kill it all together. But nonetheless, that you know, I wasn't part of, of that decision-making process. But what what I loved about the experience was that it really put me out of my comfort zone sitting in front of a camera timing your intros and outros and reading mm-hmm. a um a teleprompter and looking natural <laughs> not robotic all of that mm-hmm. was holy cow people go to school for years to learn how to do that and here i am this you know this girl off the street just yeah you came in cold completely cold right. you know really my claim to not fame even is internship Nothing. real estate investing and here i am in front of the camera trying to make it look smooth right. and simple and professional and it's anything but there were hours and hours of prep we had to do run sheets the run sheets weren't even my vo- in my vocabulary Sorry, what's a run sheet? yeah a run sheet is basically what is happening minute by minute in the episode we have that here right now you mm-hmm. just don't know yeah <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get I didn't get a copy of your run sheet, but I'm sure it's very detailed. It's all in here. So th- yeah, and the run sheets were very specific about you know where are you going to stand, who are you going to turn to, when are you going to sigh, oh, when are you going scripted. to turn back to the camera and do intros and outros. It was very very planned out, and wow. you and you had to really think about what was going to happen, and you have to have this run sheet uh, prepared for your producer days in advance mm-hmm. of the filming, and mm-hmm. then you have to go through the run sheet before you actually go on camera. So there was a lot of, you know, a half hour episode probably had about 10 hours of prep behind the scenes. And I'm not even talking about hair and makeup. And hair and makeup for three girls, you can imagine, takes some time. And then, uh, you know, shopping for outfits. And then finding sponsors. So it was a big production. And we thought, okay, well, Rogers is done. Our TV career (laughs) is is wrapped up, been Mm -hmm. there, done that, got the t-shirt. And then we got a phone call from uh, a, a, 
a person who owned a private studio mm -hmm. said, hey, I love your show. It mm -hmm. doesn't have to end. Why don't you film in our studio yeah. and, uh, and continue this pri for, like a, a private production? All you need to have is a sponsor. And we thought, oh, that's it. That's and it. that's it. Um, and then we thought, well, you know, now we have to go out knocking on doors, looking for sponsorship and putting together a sponsorship package and pitching the sponsorship package. That again took us out of our comfort zone, um, but it did pay off. We got Streetwise Mortgages uh, stepping up to yeah. become our sponsor and they sponsored our private production. And we filmed another six episodes that we then ran ourselves. Um, some of them aired on CHCH throughout Canada and the other episodes aired on our YouTube channel. So that was a totally different setting, totally different dynamics, and again, took us completely out mm -hmm. of our comfort mm -hmm. zone, but super rewarding. So I have a, a, a 12 episode television show history, and um, it was bittersweet, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. I'm really glad I got that experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the thing I wanted to highlight though is that without the provincial funding, your, sh your original show would never, never existed. And, uh, uh, and it was quality, right? And the, well, the point I'm making is that information like has someone has to pay for it mm -hmm. right and that's part and that's the problem with today's media a lot of it no one's paying for it so that they're trying to make money with whatever they're doing that's what they're just throwing clickbait at you mm -hmm. right in order to get more clicks and sell more advertising versus when there was public funding then you didn't have to do that and also thank goodness you three ladies were well off in your uh in your real estate career so you didn't need to get paid a lot of money to do this Actually, you guys, you guys we got paid anything. nothing. Yeah, you got paid nothing. You volunteered. We yes, we were just sharing our knowledge yeah. um, in in a way that was a lot more time consuming than any of us anticipated because <laughs> we had no idea what it would take to put together one episode, let alone twelve of them. Right, right, right. But uh, it, it was it was a great experience, mm -hmm. and the knowledge that we got to share um, did reach a lot of people, and it did influence a lot of mothers and others, and it inspired them on their journey with mm -hmm. real estate investing. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't trade it for the world. Sorry, when you did the the, the, the latter six episodes, was that still Mothers of Real Estate, yeah. or was that just you? No, it was still the three of us, okay. Monica, Jillian, and I as Mothers of Real Estate. Got it. And, and then why did you stop? <laughs> Time. To corral the three of us uh, to coordinate our schedules, to put together run sheets and show up on set um, was was taking away from our primary focus and our primary priorities. And we got into real estate investing, all three of us in, you know, although we follow different real estate investing strategies, we still do it from the perspective of creating time freedom. Mm -hmm. And this was countering that. Mm -hmm. it, <laughs> that there was no time freedom um, once we factored in how much we had to do to prepare right. for these right. episodes. And also the responsibility to a sponsor. When there was no sponsor, we felt like, okay, well, we'll just kind of, you know, do this and get it done. But when we had Streetwise Mortgages as a sponsor, paying hard, cold <laughs> dollars, we felt a totally different sense of responsibility. The quality couldn't be anything but stellar. And, you know, to, to put really strong quality into it, you really have to put in more time and effort into it. And we felt if we can't put the time and effort into it, then will deliver nothing at all you know so it was really just you know you have to say no. picking our priorities yeah, yeah you have to say no you do have to say no and we wanted to just stick to our lanes of our areas of expertise right. and we thought you know the the fame and stardom of it all isn't worth right you know tarnishing relationships with sponsors right because you want to win-win absolutely you want to win-win because dahlia deserves it right? absolutely right dahlia of, of streetwise like correct the relationship's way more important than the TV show, I exactly, guess. Exactly, exactly. So, and that's, folks, that's the truth about real estate investing. This, yeah. this isn't real estate. Well, it was a real estate show, so. But yeah, so it wasn't worth it. Well, not, sorry, it wasn't worth continuing. It wasn't worth continuing. Just the investment in time mm -hmm. was too much. And if we, if we didn't have any other businesses on the go, and if we didn't have our family responsibilities, mm -hmm. it would have been perfect. Mm -hmm. But then what would we talk about if we aren't talking about content from the trenches? So it, it felt like it just wasn't serving our goals as real estate investors. Right. And how right. can we sit there on camera talking about priorities and goals if we ourselves weren't being true to our own? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
No, uh, thanks for sharing that because uh, a friend of mine posted on Facebook, like, who of my friends doesn't have a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. It's true. Podcasts have definitely taken off. You are one of the first yeah. and one of the longest standing and one of the best by far. But I think you set the stage and the tone and inspired a whole bunch of other podcasters in this space mm-hmm. for the good of it or the bad of it. I don't know. Hopefully for the good of it. I hope so. You know, thankfully, like, you know, like I was saying, like a, a lot of media has to make money. Like this media doesn't necessarily have to make money. So that's why we can we can invest our time into it and, and share knowledge, right? And then what people can't see behind the camera is, you know, I have people behind the scenes working on all this to make it happen. And the equipment. Yeah. Isn't there a, a new soundboard? <laughs> There's a new soundboard that didn't come cheap. And, you know, these mics aren't cheap. You know, the same, these are the same mics that Joe Rogan uses. Yeah, and, right. and the overhead of, of, you know, having the space to yeah. do it. Yeah. It's a big investment. It's mm-hmm. not just the time. Mm-hmm. It's, it's everything that comes together. And then, of course, there's the editing component. Yeah. And, and putting it out there, um, yeah, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of work. I respect all the work and effort that goes into it. And mm-hmm. you've been doing this how long? Since 20... So I don't even know. <laughs> We've done over 200 episodes and we do roughly one a week. So yeah, so it's been like four years, four or five years. Four or five years, yeah. 200 episodes. That's, yeah. that's commitment. It is commitment. And then for anyone getting into this, like they all edit on their own. They all start editing on their own and like, Oh, good luck. Especially with, for the folks who's, who edit out the ums and ahs. They actually go listen to it and cut out the ums and ahs. <laughs> do wow. it manually. They do it themselves. <laughs> wow. Gosh, can you imagine if your guest says a lot of ums and ahs? That, that's a lot of editing. I know, exactly. And they, like, you know, like you're saying, how much time you had to invest to be in the TV show, right? What's your time worth to you? And then if, if you know, at least you like for, when you were on CHCH, for example, like you're they already had an audience, so exactly. you jumped into an audience. Exactly. With podcasts, you start cold, right? And people start posting on their Facebook, "I have a new podcast." Yeah, and just because you created an episode doesn't mean that people are going to yeah. find it. Yeah. So you still have to work at getting it known and right. getting recurring right. subscribers and mm-hmm. listeners. It's mm-hmm. it's a lot of work, and I commend you. Oh, thank I com- you. Thank I commend you, you on on all of the success you've achieved in this space. Oh, thank you, thank you. And that's why there's so many people jumping into it because you make it look easy. It's, it's your not fault. Easy. <laughs> you know, hey, you make it look easy. Like, oh, that's all Rachel does? <laughs> Puts up a Kijiji ad? No, oh, no, it's more than that. <laughs> like driving driving 800 applicants on a web page. That's, 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 that is not easy. Right? <laughs> that's really impressive, actually. It's very impressive. You should be really proud of yourselves, you and Neil. Will Neil, ever ne- Will Neil ever come on the show? I think I can get him out of his hovel. Uh, he is... He is and busy. He, he's busy. <laughs> he he has a lot on the go, and uh, I have to give him a lot of credit. He's managing the tenant buyers coming into the program. He's managing the tenant buyers that are in the program, and he's managing the tenant buyers coming out of the program. Mm-hmm. So he has a lot on the go. But uh, the good news is that we're hiring, and hopefully some of the workload will be shared soon. What are you hiring for, in case anyone listening is looking for a job? So we're looking for someone to help with uh, the, I guess, the qualification process and the screening process. And uh, someone who has the gift of the gab. Mm -hmm. Someone who has the gift of the gab and is passionate about what it is we do. Mm -hmm. Um, We want to hear from you. Excellent, excellent. And as I, made, I made a note to ask about lessons two months, which is a terrible note because I didn't I didn't remember what it meant. But now I remember because uh, during the pandemic, you took you took some time off to go to stay in Costa Rica for a little bit. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now, now you know what, yes. the, what the cue meant. That was a terrible cue for myself that I wrote. <laughs> what, what are the learning lessons? Because um, you know we saw an election. Right? It's funny because after any election, there's always somebody who wants to leave. Right? Right. Even the states, whenever they have an election, I believe the number one Google thing is like, <laughs> for the Americans, they always Google, how do I move to Canada? <laughs> it doesn't matter who wins, right? Either party wins. There's, the number one Google thing is from the Americans is, how do I move to Canada, right? Anyways, uh, I'm sure <laughs> there's people uh, who who would like to spend somewhere else, winter somewhere else. Or I'm sure there's some people talking about leaving the country <laughs> based on the election results. But that's <laughs> my question is, uh, what did you learn about spending extended time in Costa Rica? And the, first mm. of all, uh, why did you go? Uh, let's start with that. Where, why did you go to Costa Rica? Well, because it seemed like the most awkward time to travel. 
and it's oh, so let's just do it now. so okay. let's just do it now that's exactly what it was <laughs> you know we were basically in in the heat of a lockdown yet another lockdown there was a lot of uncertainty there was a lot of uh, confusion and i thought this is a perfect time to pack our bags, get on a plane, and go somewhere we've never been but always wanted to visit. Right, because business know, was slow at the time, wasn't it? Uh, no, business was actually <laughs> booming. Uh, during the pandemic, the rent-to-own business, much to my surprise, took off even even more. It was, it was like on rocket fuel or something. But we uh, can do our business from anywhere. And that was part of the the goal of, you know, can we actually make this work? Well, you know, when we're away from home in a completely different environment, let's just give it a shot for three weeks. What's the worst that can happen? And uh, the goal was, so do you say, what were we trying to accomplish? Well, I, I uh, first of all, I don't always go with the status quo. So going against the status quo um, was kind of one one of the aspects of it. My kids can't go to school. Okay, well, I'll immerse them in another environment where they will be stimulated and learn something new about a new culture, new food, new people. And um, I wanted to expose my children to something uh, more exciting than just sitting in front of a a computer all day long doing online school and I wanted to test the waters to see if we could still continue to help families rent to own in Ontario while we're out of the country. Can we support our peripheral team uh, as effectively and can we function as a team? So we took our entire team with us. So it wasn't just Neil and I and the kids. We, you know, it was Clover Properties and um, we rented a villa and we were isolated in the most beautiful part of, of uh, you know, the area. Um, and we got up with the sun, got up, got up super early, uh, 5 a.m. And uh, we continued our morning routine of health and wellness in this beautiful open air, overlooking an ocean, listening to the crashing waves. And, uh, and then we hunkered down from about, I would say, 7.30 in the morning to about uh, 3.30 in the afternoon. It was work, work, work as usual. And then after 3.30, we had an adventure waiting. We were either, you know, going to a beach to enjoy the sunset. Uh, we were, you know, going for a walk um, in, in a cute little town. Um, or we were getting into a bus going on to some, you know, excursion for the weekend. So th there was always something happening. And we were just basically juggling tourism with, with business. And... Cool. What we realized in that experience is, first of all, we can do it. Second of all, three weeks is not enough. <laughs> so I remember about a week and a half or two weeks into it, thinking to myself, I'm not ready to leave. Three weeks is not enough. I want to stay longer. How the heck am I going to broach this topic with Mr. No? who is pretty much already like has has done the math knows exactly when we're coming how much we're spending and he's very much okay this is the start of the vacation this is the end of the vacation I'm in this little you know these are my little parameters and this is how it's going to be and then Rachel sits him down and says let's talk about that <laughs> I'm you thinking moved the goal close. <laughs> I'm thinking we need to extend our travels a little bit and of course his first response was no that's not what we discussed. That's not what we budgeted for. Blah, 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 blah. And then I noticed a shift because I started saying, well, you know, there's so much more to Costa Rica than what we've experienced. We've been kind of on, on this part of, of the region, but there's also a rainforest and a cloud forest. And wouldn't it be great for our children to frolic with the monkeys in, in another part of Costa Rica and, and check out a volcano and all these other parts that... I, I thought would be easier to get to because Costa Rica deceivingly is is actually a large place and because the roads are not as well paved and and um, managed as ours to get from A to B is quite lengthy so to get to the rainforest was an eight hour trek and Whoa. we just in our three week time frame we never had a full eight hour window to get there and then an eight hour window to get back. Right. So we were going to be leaving Costa Rica without the experience of zip lining through the cloud forest. And I just said, we, we can't do that. Yeah, you need a vacation while you're on vacation. That's right. right. And slowly but surely, it took a, a good 48 hours, but Neil's like, okay, let's do this. So then we started basically planning the rest of our, 
our time there and we kind of wanted to hit different parts of it we wanted to visit the rainforest we wanted to see a, another area where there was a lot of real estate development happening we were curious about that market and of course we wanted to visit the the capital of San Jose so we kind of mapped out our you know our destinations and we continued to work all the way through and the kids continued to do online schooling all the way through right, right. The, sorry, did, that, did you stay at different places? We no? did. Okay, okay. Yeah, we rented villas all the way, all the way through. Uh, VRBO was a great resource, um, and the first villa we actually rented by fluke was from uh, a couple out of Barrie. <laughs> We're just like good old Canadians renting a villa to us for the first three weeks. And uh, are you going to go back this winter? Absolutely. I think. Yeah. Uh, I, I liked what Costa Rica had to offer. Um, it disappointed me on some things, but it uh, opened up the possibilities on other things. And uh, I, I, th I think we're going to be pursuing the opportunity to own some real estate there. Oh, and then how long do you think you'll stay? On the next, on the next round? Hmm. Well, I know that uh, two months was just right. So probably around the same. January, February? I th that was a great time to go. Yeah. It was. It was. Uh, it, it, it was just past um, past their rainy season, and the weather was fantastic. Basically, two months of solid sunshine, warm, comfortable breezes. Never was there a day when we had to look at the weather channel or check the weather on our phone to see what kind of weather are we facing today. The weather was so consistent and so predictable and it was just so freeing not to have to worry about weather permitting we'll do this or mm -hmm. weather permitting we'll do that. None of that was on the table. Every mm -hmm. day was glorious. Okay, Rachel, I have a final question of my own. <laughs> <Just> okay. <laughs> you mentioned business was booming during the pandemic what what happened like this is supposed to be a recession la la like what was what, what was the trigger for people were they looking for more space were these people coming from renting to wanting to they, they, I, don't, I don't know what pushed them over the edge but they wanted to stop renting start owning that's a great question. I think it was a, a combination of a lot of things. I think a lot of people had the if not now then when kind oh, of perspective. Going YOLO. All right. <laughs> I think there was a lot of like, we've waited this long. There's no more waiting. Let's do this now. I think also the fact that people could work from home gave people more flexibility as to where they could potentially own. Whereas someone thought, oh, you know, my job is downtown. Therefore, I, I need to continue to stay in the downtown core. That was no longer on the table because we had so many people now working from home and it was working and you know employers were not s seeing people coming back to the office anytime mm -hmm. soon mm -hmm. so a lot of people thought oh well this market is out of reach for me financially which is fine i've come to terms with that i can move an hour out of the city afford to own something there and not have to compromise my well-paying job which is out of downtown Toronto because my boss is okay with me working from home now that we've experimented with it. I think that was a huge catalyst for a lot of people as well. Fantastic. All right, Rachel, we're a bit over time as usual. <laughs> it's, you're just a wealth of knowledge. And Thanks. I hope people appreciate that. Like we, we were really lucky to have you today uh, sharing uh, because, for example, I asked you that qu last question because you have a large sample of people that you've spoken to. <laughs> so that's probably a very qualified answer and opinion because a lot of people, you know, again, media, a lot of unqualified opinions. <laughs> whatever. Uh, Rachel, any final words? Anything you want to share with the listener? Uh, for, sorry, first off, if they, if they want to follow along with Rachel Oliver, where do they, how, where do they follow along? Um, well, they can find me they can find me on hellocashflow.ca if they're interested in the cash flow side of rent to own and uh, if they're interested in learning more about how the program works from the home buyer's point of view rethinkrenting.ca and when it comes to the final thoughts like in what realm are we talking about anything real estate are we talking about uh, investing starting growing 
I often think to whoever whoever's struggling. So, you know, we're so lucky. A lot of us, some of the people listening are so lucky. Yourself and I were very lucky to, 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 to be in the real estate industry and holding what we hold. What would you say to this person who's still on the fence about investing? Because, hmm. oh man, I hope they're not on the fence. <laughs> Hopefully they've already taken action. <laughs> well, there'll always be somebody who's starting. And there's always somebody who, even if they're not on the fence, they might have a partner who's on the fence that's holding them back. So it's not always that one person's fault because... Um, Get a new partner. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that is not my advice. Um, I, think, I think it has to uh, start with, you know, how do you picture your life three or four years from now? You know, sometimes we get so wrapped up in looking at our world as it is today. So get get your head out of that sand and start looking further out. You know, what does your life look like a year from now, two years from now, three years from now? Who are you hanging out with? What kind of things are you doing? And then work it backwards from there. What is it going to take for you to be able to do that? And some a- answers will come to you. So. So in some cases, cash flow investing might support some of your interests. We have some investors who just want to golf all year long. They just want to travel to different destinations, to different golf courses, and they need the cash flow from the rent owned properties to do that. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. they have five or six properties and that's sustaining their their you know passion for golf. Um, other people, you know, they're they're dreaming of um, you know, their, their kids are going to be entering university and they want to be able to pay for them to live off campus. So they're using the cash flow for those types of means and, and they're delighted to be able to support their kids on their on their journey. Um, or, you know, w- w- maybe you have children that are going to be going to daycare and you want to have extra resources to cover the costs of daycare. There are so many different things and different different ways that rent to own investing can benefit you and your lifestyle and maybe maybe it's not cash flow you're after maybe it's um you know you know maybe it's something else that's going to mean something to you but i think if you kind of get your um vision on what does the future look like and then start working it backwards from there it'll be much easier to make a decision as to what kind of move today is going to get you closer to your vision that was pretty good We'll leave it there. Thank you, Rachel, for doing this. Thanks so much for coming out. My pleasure. Thank you.